Uh, right. So I'll be solving a few doubts uh, in oral pathology which have been put forth by students. So the first question is, large pulp chambers are characteristic of all of the following conditions except. Now uh, let's take it option by option. So first I'll start with option D that is den dentinogenesis imperfecta. Now this is a genetic condition inherited in an autosomal dominant manner usually associated with a mutation in this DSPP gene which is the dentine sialophosphoprotein gene. So what happens in this condition is the teeth which are formed they are discolored they are kind of blue grey to yellowish in color they are translucent or opalescent in consistency and uh, the enamel uh, formation is normal the enamel thickness is normal but the dentine is extremely thin and there's an abnormality in the dentine due to this abnormality in dentine the teeth are much more weak brittle and they easily wear off so that is um, what is basically this di or dentinogenesis imperfecta now when you classify di uh, shields has classified it into three types so type one is di along with osteogenesis imperfecta which is a brittle bone condition type 2 is only an isolated di and the rarest type or type 3 it's called di of the brandywine type now in this type 1 and type 2 mainly you will find that the pulp chambers are completely obliterated or it's very small and there are a lot of pulp stones with very small roots but um, in type 3 this specific type of uh, di which is type 3 what happens is that the uh, teeth are extremely enlarged or kind of a shell teeth type of appearance as you can see here the teeth are very large uh, that is the uh, the pulp chambers are extremely enlarged un unlike type 1 and type 2 so what happens is that the enamel is normal but the dentine is extremely thin which is why the pulp chambers appear to be extremely enlarged so uh, these are called as shell teeth so in type 3 of di uh, that is shell teeth we will find large pulp chambers so actually speaking if they, since they put the option as di not all types of dentinogenesis imperfecta have enlarged pulp only type 3 which is your option 1 which is shell teeth so shell teeth will have large pulp chambers now coming to the next option torodontism uh, torodontism is also um, an abnormality in tooth development or a developmental disturbance wherein the body or the crown of the tooth is extremely enlarged at the expense of the roots meaning the uh, at the expense of the roots so since the crown of the tooth is extremely enlarged and uh, uh, due to this characteristic appearance of the tooth it's also called the bull tooth appearance as you can see the normal constriction which should be present at the cej or the cemento enamel junction that constriction is not present and uh, in this condition what happens you can see it can be a synodont or normal and as it goes from mild to severe you can see how that the furcation area is extremely low down and the pulp chamber is extremely enlarged and the uh, floor of the pulp appears to be much more apically or near the apex of the tooth so this is due to this appearance is called the bull tooth so definitely torodontism also has enlarged pulp chambers now uh, so torodontism does now coming to dentine dysplasia now dentine dysplasia is another developmental condition and as the name suggests it's again a disturbance in dentine formation so if whenever dentine formation is affected along with that the pulp there will be some abnormalities in it so dentine dysplasia again you have normal enamel but abnormal dentine and pulp the teeth when you look at them they appear normal but they are extremely weak they are very mobile and again there are different types in dentine dysplasia so you have uh, dentine dysplasia 1 2 and so on now in this dentine dysplasia the type 1 will have normal um, uh, similarly obliterated pulp chambers but there's a specific type of dentine dysplasia which is type 2 whereas you can see that the pulp chamber is extremely and abnormally large and instead of being obliterated as seen in type 1 it's extremely large and it's more large at the cervix and it narrows towards the apex so due to this appearance of the pulp it is uh, also called as flame shaped or a thistle tube appearance of pulp so definitely in dentine dysplasia type 2 we have abnormally large pulp chambers now uh, the confusion is actually c and d because yes a and b do have large pulp chambers but in c and d only a specific type of it has 
लार्ज पल्प चेम्बर्स वो सो इन डेंटीन डिस्प्लेज है इट्स टाइप टू एंड इन डी आई इट्स टाइप थ्री विच इज शेल टूथ सो आई वुड स्टिल से हियर द आंसर वुड बी ऑप्शन डी दैट इज डेंटिनोजेनिस इम्परफेक्टा सिंस देव ऑलरेडी मैंशन द स्पेसिफिक टाइप एज शेल टीथ इन वन ऑफ द ऑप्शन द एक्सेप्शन हियर आई बिलीव वुड बी डी आई बट जस्ट कीप इन माइंड दैट इन डेंटीन डिस्प्लेज है ऑल्सो इट्स ओनली द टाइप टू विच हैज द large pulp chambers so i hope that answers your question now the next question is why does acid phosphatase increase in osteopetrosis a student had a doubt regarding this now two things to keep in mind there are two important enzymes which serve as important markers for any abnormality so one is alkaline phosphatase and one is acid phosphatase now acid phosphatase will be a marker of the resorption of bone that is uh, osteoclastic activity of the uh, cells and uh, alkaline phosphatase will tell you about the osteoblastic activity now uh, the marker of bone resorption would be acid phosphatase and the marker of bone deposition would be alkaline phosphatase now what is osteopetrosis osteopetrosis is something which is also known as marble bone disease or albers schonberg disease wherein what happens is that there is excessive bone density with obliteration of the marrow cavity so due to some genetic defect the osteoclasts are not functioning properly and there is excessive formation of bone and normally bone remodeling is a process where there should be a balance in between bone resorption which is done by osteoclasts and bone deposition done by osteoblasts due to loss of this balance these defects or bony lesions occur so due to the defective in remodeling what happens the osteoclastic function gets affected now the now one would say that since there is more bone formation then why not alkaline phosphatase because alkaline phosphatase tells us about osteoblastic activity but what happens in this condition you have to keep in mind this important sentence that the osteoclastic number is more only thing is that the osteoclasts are not performing their function well so there are a lot of excessive osteoclasts because since in this disease there is so much of osteoblastic activity and so much of excessive bone formation as a compensatory mechanism the marrow is producing more osteoclasts to balance it out but what happens that these osteoclasts are not performing their function so due to the increased osteoclastic number when you check the lab values you will actually find that a uh, specific type of acid phosphatase which is seen in the bones called as the tartrate resistant acid phosphatase that has increased so uh, to uh, one more thing to keep in mind like i said defective bone resorption with continued bone deposition but increased osteoclast so they fail to function normally but they are if you take the blood and you uh, marrow and you sample the cell number you will find a lot of number of osteoclasts due to excessive number of osteoclasts there will be in the lab results you will find that there's elevated levels of acid phosphatase creatinine kinase and pth so uh, don't get too confused with the pathophysiology just remember that in osteopetrosis there is excessive uh, bone density defective bone remodeling there is decreased osteoclastic function but the osteoclastic number is more that's why you will find more amount of acid phosphatase that's if you know this much also it's enough so if a mcq is asked regarding in which condition will acid phosphatase increase so osteopetrosis is one uh, important uh, le- uh, condition and another important thing is any kind of prostate uh, infections or any conditions involving the prostate prostate cancers benign hypertrophy of prostate all of these will also have increased acid phosphatase because it is pre- it is present in very large numbers in the prostate so it's a very useful marker for prostatic cancer so remember these two conditions now similarly for alkaline phosphatase there are a number of conditions where it is increased so here an mcq was asked so whenever you see that a question has been asked regarding increased alkaline phosphatase your answer should directly be paget's disease paget's disease also is a very uh, important condition where there is a defect in remodeling but what happens here is there are it happens in again the remodeling doesn't occur well so that there is excessive bone turnover but the bones which are formed they are extremely weak and fragile now um 
in this paget's disease there are technically four phases initially there'll be um, increased osteoclast but later what happens there'll be excessive osteoblastic activity because since the bones which are being formed are very weak there'll be as a compensation lot of osteoblastic activity due to which the alkaline phosphatase increases so keep this in mind don't go too much into the pathophysiology i just want you all to remember two basic things what each enzyme stands for so acid phosphatase is a marker of osteoclastic bone resorption it increases in conditions like marble bone or uh, osteopetrosis along with prostate cancers whereas alkaline phosphatase is a marker of osteoblastic activity it increases very high in paget's disease and along with that in any liver dysfunction so it's present in a large amount in the liver so in these two conditions it will be elevated if you want to know some other conditions they are mentioned here also remember primary hyperparathyroidism and hyperthyroidism as well along with osteomalacia which is vitamin d deficiency in these conditions also you will find an increase in alkaline phosphatase also remember one thing in fibrous dysplasia usually the levels of these enzymes are normal just remember this much it would be enough for you now the next question is in which of the following dental sequelae is likely in a child with generalized growth failure or failure to thrive in the first 6 months of life now um, remember one thing they have mentioned the first 6 months of life first six, when something happens that early on in life it's usually due to any defect in the enamel because you can see enamel hypoplasia it is a condition wherein there are lines pits or grooves now we all know amelogenesis or enamel formation it starts from the occlusal portion and then proceeds towards the apex so while this process or gradual process of amelogenesis is occurring during that if there's any stress any environmental impact anything which can upset these ameloblasts or these enamel forming cells what happens the formation will get interrupted at that point and that interruption will appear like a pit or a groove or a line on the tooth so what happens this condition you can see the teeth will be discolored and there'll be pits and grooves on the teeth and this is known as enamel hypoplasia now there are a number of conditions in which it has been linked it does not usually occur on its own there are some causes behind it so it can be linked with a number of conditions pre or postnatal infections respiratory distress gi infections anemia failure to thrive which is what has been asked in the mcq viral and bacterial infections and metabolic disturbances so you can see how even such a small thing like the enamel over your tooth even if that is not formed well it can be linked to a number of quite severe conditions so to answer your question here the which sequelae is likely to occur in um, in a child with growth failure most commonly it is due to this enamel hypoplasia you can understand that a retrusive maxilla or a retrusive mandible it will affect the growth of the facial bones or it will affect your occlusion but it won't really affect your failure to thrive that severely in the first 6 months itself so you can eliminate these two and di dentinogenesis imperfecta essentially will affect only that particular tooth it won't cause some long term systemic issues yes later on over time if the teeth become brittle and break and all of those conditions yes it can affect the nutrition and the affect the uh, intake of food and everything but in the first 6 months of life itself it won't cause such long term effect so the answer here would be option b or enamel hypoplasia now um one question was asked that what is hurler syndrome what happens and it's an accumulation of what so there's no need to know too much in depth about it but just remember there's something known as glycosaminoglycans which you all very well know about which are also known as the mucopolysaccharides so these mucopolysaccharides are essential components of our cells so um what happens is that these mucopolysaccharides are formed and then they are regularly broken down but if these mucopolysaccharides are fail fail to break down they'll start accumulating and resulting in some systemic problems and the enzymes which are responsible for breaking them down if there's any defect in that enzyme it can lead to 
accumulation of some uh, substances which can be harmful so a uh, number of diseases can occur so mps1 2 so they are classified into many types based upon which enzyme is involved so the first one the most um, dangerous one you can say that mucopolysaccharidosis 1 is known as the hurler disease so this hurler disease basically it is was also known as gargoyleism and uh, there is a defect or complete absence of this enzyme called alpha l hydroronidase which is responsible for degradation of the gag so this very important enzyme which will break down these glycosaminoglycans is completely absent or it is defective due to that there's build up of two important um, substances or two main substances which is dermatin sulfate and heparin sulfate so due to build up of these um substances in different parts of the body in multiple tissues it can result in a number of clinical uh, signs and symptoms as you can see it will build up in the joints and cause stiffness it will cause a claw like hands along with uh, accumulation in important vital organs resulting in enlargement of the heart spleen and liver so cardiomegaly splenomegaly hepatomegaly it can cause corneal clouding depressed nasal bridge macroglossia so these are all happening due to accumulation of these substances which should ideally have been broken down and absorbed or excreted but they are not able to get absorbed or broken down so they will accumulate and result in this now due to this claw like hands and stiffness of the joints it was also called as gargoyleism so th the question was what exactly accumulates in this mps1 or hurler syndrome so to answer your question it is the dermatin sulfate and heparin sulfate now this qu the next question is dermoid cyst is a type of fall cyst cystic teratoma hamartoma and choreostoma now uh, you have to understand what each of these things actually mean so first one is fall cyst a fall cyst is basically a cyst which does not have any epithelial lining whereas a true cyst is a cyst which has a good epithelial lining our dermoid cyst which we see on the skin it does have a stratified squamous epithelium lining it so it is not a fall cyst so we can eliminate option a cystic teratoma a teratoma is basically something which is formed from all the three germ layers that is the ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm whereas our dermoid cyst is usually derived mainly from the ectoderm only so we can eliminate teratoma now hamartoma and choreostoma just don't get confused between the two a choreostoma basically means that it's an accumulation of cells which are normal or it is well organized but not in the right location for example in the stomach there will be an accumulation of pancreatic cells if that occurs that will be a choreostoma the cells are well organized but they do not belong to that particular organ so they are located in the wrong place or in the wrong location so that is called a choreostoma so it's basically normal tissue in an abnormal location so just remember that normal tissue in an abnormal location whereas a hamartoma is the exact opposite it's abnormal tissue but in the correct location for example in the lung you will have a mass of very unorganized parenchymal cells and cartilage so lung parenchymal cells or cartilage and blood vessels so basically those cells are normally found in the lung but they are not organized as they should be so that will be a hamartoma so again just to repeat choreostoma is location of is the presence of normal and organized tissue in the wrong location whereas a hamartoma is a mass of disorganized tissue but in the correct location now just think of a dermoid cyst a dermoid cyst as the name suggests should be located over the skin and yes it is located over the skin but the connection of the tissue is very disorganized so that's the reason why a dermoid cyst is considered to be a hamartoma so what happens is that during the fetal development there are some certain lines along which all the structures will close and meet right since all of the structures are growing from either right and left and they eventually meet in the midline or there are some lines of closure but what happens sometimes along the lines of closure when the line suppose there's a line and it's closing over this but there is some entrapment of skin or some uh, subcutaneous tissue along the line so it's not closing smoothly but there's some 
amount of entrapment due to that entrapment of skin or the what happens that the tissues which are formed will get disorganized but they are located over the skin itself so that's why a dermoid cyst since it's disorganized tissue in the native location it is a hamartoma so if you understand what a hamartoma means you can understand so it's a dermoid cyst it is a true cyst it's not false it is a hamartoma so to answer your question dermoid cyst is a option c hamartoma now uh, this question is supernumerary tooth or tooth within tooth is most commonly seen with now the problem with this question is there are two separate conditions which they have asked so if we cut them into separate conditions so when you talk about supernumerary teeth which is basically like an additional or an extra tooth what happens is that this supernumerary tooth most commonly what we see is the mesiodens the mesiodens which is located in between the two central incisors as an as an extra tooth this is the most common type of su supernumerary tooth and that is seen between the maxillary central incisors after that the second most common one would be the distal molar or an extra molar which is located distal to the third molar so uh, in supernumerary teeth the most common one is seen in relation with the maxillary central incisors when we talk about tooth within tooth which is nothing but our dens in dente or dens in vaginatus which is an infolding of the layers of the tooth so that is most commonly seen as a pit or a deep uh, invagination along the palatal side or the lingual side of the tooth most commonly associated with the lateral incisors permanent maxillary lateral incisors so tooth within tooth is most commonly seen with the lateral incisors so although in the book the option is given as a i would say option d is correct because supernumerary tooth is associated with central incisor and tooth within tooth is associated with the lateral incisors so here i would say option b is correct